Balrogs and Blast Beats for another week. The coolest uncool podcast that there ever there was. Just a just a weekly reason for some nerds to get around and come and hang out. I'm one of your hosts, Josh Redbeard. I'm Margie. I didn't miss my cue this time. Hey. Nailed it. <laughs> and I'm Grant. And uh, actually joining us today, if you could see us, if you're watching on YouTube, we have a special guest, Tristan. So uh, he's uh, he works in the special effects community and... Um, Usually we uh, start off talking about the nerdiest thing we've done. So I'm going to throw to you today, Tristan, to see what's the nerdiest thing you've done this week so we can, you know, get to know you a little bit and chat some shit. Yeah, cool. Well, um, I've been living in a hotel since February on this film and there's not a lot to do here. So (laughs) um, I just started building Gundam models this week, which has been fun. Getting back into doing stuff like that. So do you have cool. to paint them as well? Or do they come painted or you got to paint them as well? Uh, so they come like the plastic parts are coloured, but then like yeah. I painted over the top and added weathering and details. And yeah, sick. Yeah, because I, like I, was, I, I was like that. Wow, you should work in more... special effects. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was just thinking that looks way more detailed than like your like normal like Gundam toy. Like they usually wouldn't, yeah, the weathering and like... Yeah, like the depth of color yeah, as well. No, it's really cool. I added a bit of stuff to it. <laughs> <laughs> you made it better. Uh, how love- about yourself, Josh? What, what's the nerdiest thing you've been up to this week? Uh, well, Grant, you would know, actually. Actually, no, because you came late, so you wouldn't know. I mean, you'd know kind of half of it. We um, <laughs> we went to a, a, a Magic the Gathering pre-release party, and I tried to think about how to condense pre-release as much as possible for Magic the Gathering. So basically, for the layman, uh, Magic the Gathering releases multiple sets a year. Every time they release a set, the week before, they do like a pre-release where they give you a little pack that has like five uh, packs of cards in it, and from these cards, you make like a real kind of tiny deck and then you fight other people with your tiny decks. And it's always kind of balanced because it's not like people are like <laughs> buying. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a 40 card deck and we play commander. We play uh, with a hundred card deck. So it is a tiny deck. It's like, it's, uh, not, it's you, we all know it's not the size of the deck that counts. Come on, mate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I proved that it's not the size of the deck that counts because yeah. So pretty much then you play three lots of best of three. Um, and then the more you win, like the, the game store, wherever you're playing at, will give you like extra packs of cards. And I won almost three rounds. It was, I won the first two rounds three and oh, uh, and then the second one I lost two one and I was, uh, I was kind of sad. So I almost cleaned up at Magic the Gathering pre-release. Uh, but then I didn't and I got sad. <laughs> <laughs> you did, I think that's admirable. Well, I, I was pretty happy. It was my first pre-release, so I was pretty happy with that. I don't really <laughs> like drafting. I don't like, like, I like taking my time with my decks. Um, I'm building six brand new decks at the moment, but that's a story for another day. Um, <laughs> Margie, what's the, what's the nerdiest thing you've done this week? Well, I, I, I went, I went bush. I went back to my Queensland home, so I didn't really do much nerding. I was, you know, wandering around avocado trees and like not using technology. It was fantastic, but Turns out I am a massive fucking nerd um, because with, there's an echidna that lives on my parents' farm. It's really cute. And my sister-in-law is Canadian and I was like, you know, we were staying there watching it and it's so, <laughs> it's got a little beak and it's got little feet and has like a little tail and a real fat bum. It's so cute. Anyway, and then I started going into graphic detail about monotremes because monotreme means single opening. That's like the Greek derivatization of the word. Um because they only have one opening for their fecal, urinal, and reproductive tracts. So they're kind of like chickens, but they're like mammals as well, because they lay an egg and then they have like a tiny tiny baby that hatches and then it crawls into like their little pouch and they have like, they produce milk through the skin 
like so their skin just oozes milk so the baby oh no they don't have pouches because they're not my super duh. so but they in like a region of their stomach they just ooze milk through the skin and it's really gross and i was talking about that yeah. and then i started talking about like how tiny baby joeys are when they're born and stuff and she was like please stop but um yeah l- turns out i'm a big fan of the ornithorhynchus tachyglossus and zaglossus there's ornithorhynchus you pineapples. just made that up yeah zaglossus <laughs> definitely sounds made up ornithorhynchus is a great word that's a platypus that's what you should that's what everyone should call platypus instead of why it. does that sound like a foot doctor it does a bit <laughs> maybe they are they have venomous spikes they could numb you with their venom and then use their electrical sensing that they have in their beaks to uh <laughs> so like to see got- what's wrong I've got like a weird connection here in my brain. So like, say you're playing Mario Kart, right? You got the blue shell with the spikes on it. Is that yeah. an echidna? And is the reason why it slides, is it the milk? So like you throw the blue shell <laughs> in Mario Kart. And it's because it's got the milk on it. That it's, it lubricates it. Is- Sorry, echidnas do not have shells. They are mammals. Um, <laughs> they have a skeleton inside them. No, it's really funny. It's like they're really hairy amongst their spikes. So you, like you want to pat them until they put their spikes off. And then you're like, don't want to pat that. But um, anyway. Oh, uh, is, it, is it okay if you just pat it one way? But you just can't go back? Or are they, are they all directions? I reckon scratching it around the chin would be nice because their defense mechanism is to curl up into a ball and dig their claws in so they cover <laughs> up all the soft bits so they're just spikes. Um, yeah, turns out I low- know a lot about uh, animals because uh, <laughs> hyperfixations. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, if anyone wants to talk more about egg laying mammals, I'm your gal. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to keep that in mind. So, uh, first of all, before we get into the long beat today, I think we're just going to talk to Tristan a little bit just to figure out, you know, a little more about him. As as you see the title of the episode today, he's going to be talking a lot about special effects. So, we thought, well, Imagine. we, we kind of know a dude that does, a, you know, a smidgen of special effects in a, <laughs> quite a few gigantic films. So, we thought, oh, well, we might as well ask him a few questions along the way. So, I guess, you know... What made you want to get into special effects? Like, how does one get from there? Because I remember, like, when I first, like, met you, you were playing guitar for a band called Exposures. And then it was later, later that I found out that you did all this fucking wicked cool special effects shit. So, I don't even... How do you get from... How do you get to that kind of career path? Well, I knew I wanted to work in film since I was about eight years old. I uh, I watched Empire Strikes Back and I was like, ooh, I want to do that. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And... So I started making my own really, really shitty films when I was a teenager. Yes. And then I got really, really into horror. And mm-hmm. because of the horror aspect, I had to start doing really shitty makeup in it. <laughs> and I just found that I liked that more than the other aspects. Yeah, right. Um, basically, I took a large detour from that. And when I finished high school, I thought I had to do a, a normal thing. So I went to uni and studied journalism for three years, which was uh, a waste of time. <laughs> they no longer teach journal. They no longer teach journalism at unis. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. <laughs> but basically, after that, I was like, "No, fuck that! I want to. I want to get back into doing the film stuff." And I just started volunteering on everything I could, like student films, plays, anything that would have me. I, I spent three years volunteering on on everything I could before I got my first paid job, which was on uh, the Babadook. Oh nice. really? Dude, I love what? that movie. Yeah. That's yeah, sick. Yeah. Damn. Was, and and How luckily much did for, you hate if you get into kid? something. Hey. Did you get uh, to see no, the kid? I wasn't actually he... <laughs> I wasn't on set for it. I just built stuff in the workshop, thankfully. Uh, yeah, because yeah. yeah, that would have been a lot. <laughs> you would have had, night- uh, had nightmares for years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um But yeah, luckily the the industry, especially when it comes to like prosthetic makeup, is pretty small. So once you've kind of got a foot in the door, you're pretty good. As long as your work's good, your networking's good. Um, so once I started working, I just haven't really stopped. Yeah, fuck yeah. Is what there like career highlights so far? Yeah. Um, for well, a lot. Um, the first big, big, big film I did was Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, that was that was <laughs> eye opening because it was my first like like tentpole movie feature mm. that was, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in the budget and 
Was Johnny Depp's eye makeup special insane. effects? Does that fall into that category? <laughs> <laughs> he, had, he had his own makeup. special makeup artist. <laughs> yeah. um, Alien Covenant was another highlight for me. I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of the Alien series. And I got to make the Xenomorphs and, and Neomorphs for that, which was pretty fucking wild. Honestly, the film sucks, but it was really it, fun to work on. It was funny. A couple, <laughs> a couple episodes ago, we did uh, talk about like an episode about reboots or remakes. And I remember actually seeing your post about the fact that like you've made all these fantastic practical effects and they're just like, hmm, let's just yeah. ruin everything with CGI and fuck the film. Yeah. Yeah. And just Don't want to save the day? That, CGI. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> that was the first thing. Like, Because I, I went and saw a double feature of – alien one and uh, alien and aliens just before covenant mm. came out and they showed a scene of alien covenant in the middle which unfortunately was the best scene of the film like when the ship blows up and it's like when you're first like everything's starting to go off and even like watching that like in between like the two original alien films and just seeing like you know all the like cgi blood splatter and stuff and everything just it just didn't look right it just didn't have the same soul i just yeah, I, yeah, and then once I went to see the movie, I was already disappointed because the best part I'd seen before it come out, and then also like the rest <laughs> yeah. of it. I mean, it's just yeah, the rest of it. See, CGI <laughs> blood is like my most hated thing in the world. Like, it never looks good. <laughs> like, for, yeah, especially in Covenant, right? There's the the backburster scene when they're in the yeah. med lab, and the that's that's the one that's, out of the back. That's the scene that they showed yeah. in the cinema. So we used so much fucking blood for that scene. It was the bloodiest set I've ever been on. And they still felt the need to add digital blood to it that completely ruined it. I don't understand. So what's yeah. the secret to good fake blood? Um, the, Real blood. You've rubbed a blood yeah, tank. No. <laughs> no, no. So uh, most people like to, when they're making fake blood, put like blue and green in as a, mm. to darken the blood down. Don't do that. Never do that. You can get a, a food ingredient called um, Parisian Essence. It's a browning agent. That Ooh. pillar box red and some yellow, you're set. Yeah. That's, it. That's your blood nice. color. No, I nice. like to use imitation maple syrup as a base. <laughs> it's uh, oh, yeah. quite good. And a little, if it's not going in the mouth, a couple of drops of detergent in it. <laughs> so the detergent acts oh, as like, like a surfactant and stops it, which just yeah. stops it from beating up on the surface. So you'll actually get like, like especially if you're putting it over something like silicon, which is what we use for prosthetics, mm. you put blood on it and it'll just bead away. But yeah, you put yeah. Detergent okay. in it, just sits on it nicely. Oh, oh that's cool. my god! Oh, so does the you know what I'm doing like, after this. Kind of do like kind of like eat away <laughs> at it a bit instead of like like say you got like a newly polished car and it gets water on it and the water beads up. Whereas an old car, it's like mm. is it kind of like is it kind of like a like an adjutant when you put the detergent in there to the silicon? Is that how it works? It kind of just breaks the surface tension a bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, nothing sticks to silicon. It's a good and bad thing yeah. about silicon is that nothing sticks to it except itself. But with the detergent, it acts as a – it breaks up the surface tension so it can actually flow properly on it. Yeah, hell yeah. Yes. That's <laughs> oh, my God. So that's so cool. That's what I love these days is like – and I and I guess it's something I, I, I want to dig in a little bit more when you were saying about, you know – when you started this quite young, obviously the internet wasn't what it, what it was, you know, when we were young and wanted to get into this kind of stuff, but like Googling these days, there's a million fucking recipes for fake blood. And the one, the one mm. I ended up finding, uh, ruined, uh, <laughs> the vocalist of a very, very popular Australian heavy metal bands day when I was just kind of like, <laughs> Oh yeah, this will work. It was like, uh, it's like, it's like a clear golden syrup sort of thing. I can't remember what it was. Some sticky sort of sugar syrup. And then just like threw in some like red food syrup? diet. And, yeah, corn syrup. And it, like, yeah, that's some red food dye. I was like, yeah, this looks fine. And it was like, it looks great on film, but he had to play a show that night and we kind of poured it all over him and he could Stain. not get it out of him. He ended up having <laughs> to perform the show with all this fake blood on because he could not get it off. Was that, was that the clowns video where he's on the chair in the alley? Or is that nah, it was one? um no nah, it was CJ McMahon. It was uh for the <laughs> Murder. We did, we did it before the art played uh Max Watts in Melbourne, just like in the alleyway out the back of it. And the photos looked sick, but yeah, yeah he was he was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good trick, good trick for getting stains from fake blood out, shaving foam. Once oh, you wash shit. it off, just work some lathers and shaving foam into it, stains will come right out. Damn. 
Damn. I like uh, that. The only, sp- the only special that. effects we've done in music videos. Actually, we've done quite a few, but uh, I think our first one was uh, one of the Plovers film shoot clips has got, um, it's like us and we're all slowly getting tortured and we have like st- stuff oozing out from like, it's all in black and white, but the way that we did it. And, so, and then we keyed in over it like static and stuff but we did that using green stuff so that we could key it in um for like this music video so you know someone's bleeding from the eyes um i got waterboarded with it and then like (laughs) our lead singer's like slowly coughing it up and it's like dripping down his head um and we just did green food coloring and cornstarch and water (laughs) my god the taste was (laughs) <laughs> so like what if like one of them like was like taking mouthfuls to like cough up and then they were like actually threw up like a little bit because it was so <laughs> gross so i mean we did that in a garage and like the floor of the garage was green we were all green the shower was green everything was green for so <laughs> long afterwards that's, oh uh, i guess that's why you get out uh, the imitation maple syrup at least it tastes nice <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> But I like, I think that's, that's kind of where I kind of wanted to start with you, Tristan, because obviously like a, a lot of, I guess what we wanted to kind of focus talking about is kind of the, that's sort of the history of it, but especially the transition we saw like through the nineties into the two thousands from like, like obviously just practical effects into digital effects into like where we are today. And you, you said you started you know quite young doing the stuff you got into it when you were first looking to get into this, how much, uh, how much information was available? Like, how did you find out? what to do in your first couple of films? Well, it was a lot of trial and error. Um, Like nowadays, yeah, there's an amazing amount of resources out there for learning this kind of stuff. But back when I was doing it, you know, there was, there was a couple of books, one specific book um, that was kind of like my Bible that I just read back to front over and over again. And it was a case of like, I mean, materials were, a lot harder to get in Australia as well, but it was getting my hands on stuff and kind of just trial and error, like making mistakes. I think making mistakes is the best way to learn because it informs you for the future. So when, if you're in a workshop running something and it goes wrong, you can go, Oh, I know why this went wrong. Unless it's like a fake glass window that that someone has to smash through. (laughs) If that goes wrong, that could go really wrong. (laughs) Yeah. That's not ideal. (laughs) Um, but yeah, mostly just just it was books and trial and error. Hmm. See how I really started learning. What's the first special effect that like you did and you were like, "This is the coolest thing I've ever done." Like, was <laughs> when, what was like that <laughs> moment? <laughs> uh, oh, the first one I did that I thought was good probably was just uh, fucking around with some friends in my like high school band back in the day and. Yeah. I did this like big slit throat on him in the bathtub and just like staged some crime scene photos. And afterwards I was like, oh shit, this is pretty, it's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> I should get That's back awesome. into this. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, oh, I do have a question for you. What do you reckon would be your dream gig? Like, you know, you could work with anyone, like say like fucking, you know, Rob Button, Sam Raimi, be on a Sam Raimi movie or something like that. Like what would your dream gig be? Well, oh, well, funny. Talking about Sam Raimi, I did just do the new Evil Dead film. What? Oh my god! Yeah, we, <laughs> we shot that. We shot that in New Zealand last year. Um, Evil Dead Rise. I'm very excited for that to come out. That was a lot of blood. I imagine insane. <laughs> a lot of blood. A lot of yes. fun. It's very different to anything else in the franchise. Like, oh, there's no not much trees. connecting it outside of the Necronomicon. No trees. Oh, set in the okay. Partner block. Okay. Oh, um, true. Yeah. But the, okay. the script, I read the script on the flight from uh, Melbourne to New Zealand and it's just insane. Like each page, it just exponentially gets more and more insane from the moment it starts, just levels up until the end. Um, I hope it's going to be pretty good. We had a lot of fun filming it. Sounds fantastic. Oh, already. But, I'm keen. <laughs> but dream job for me, hands down, is Star Wars. I need to work on a Star Wars film. Absolutely. I don't care what I'm doing on it. I just I just need to be on one. I'll yeah, fucking I'll sweep floors. I'll yeah, pay yeah, to be yeah, there. Yeah. I don't care. Just <laughs> I need to work on one. I think it was- uh, I will was hide in the ceiling. The last episode, we were talking about like uh, people who influenced like 
you know, scenes and stuff. And I was just talking about like industrial light and magic and, you know, the volume and all that mm-hmm. kind of shit. I'm just like, just like, how they, just like, imagine like being able to work in that, like the volume, that'd be so fucking cool. Yeah. A hundred percent. But like Star Wars is such a, uh, I, I think an important example of kind of what, you know, one of the, the shifts we kind of saw from practical into digital effects happened, I think, with the the Star Wars prequels in particular, you know, because obviously yeah. the original Star Wars films were very, very effects. Hey, quit like, ruining like my practical. notes. I don't have many. <laughs> practical <laughs> effects heavy. Um, but yeah, the, the, the prequels obviously just went, oh, we can do everything in digital. Like I heard apparently they didn't actually make any Stormtrooper costumes like at all. Apparently all of that was digital. And so there's like no props like there was for the original. I, I just assumed that they just would have used them from the first movies and that's why they didn't have to make any, but, but yeah, I guess so. I know, I know a lot of people that worked on them. Um, there, there was a lot of props. There's actually, funnily enough, especially in Phantom Menace, there is a ton of miniature work. There's heaps yeah, okay. of amazing miniatures. That whole pod race sequence, mm. all the stadium, all those, that's all miniatures. Um, a lot of the Naboo stuff was miniatures, the ships. The CG definitely was overboard, and by the time you get to Revenge of the Sith, it's just all green screen. Yeah, all encumbrance. Mm-hmm. Like I, I know one of my friends um, made R2 and C-3PO for Episodes 2 and 3, and they'd spent you know months building these droids, especially R2 that was remote-controlled and did everything you need, and they'd take That's it to deep. set and get it prepped, and George would walk in and be like, ah, we're just going to do it digital today. And they're like, ah, okay. Do they still yeah, have thanks. the R2? <laughs> When they tell you that story, got though, do, they do, it. do they do this first? Like, oh, we're going to do it digital today. Yeah. <laughs> I can't help but notice really your surname is the uh, is is the same as uh, George's. Uh, <laughs> I'm guessing it was yeah, neck. That's just that's just coincidence. <laughs> just coincidence. <laughs> but it's yeah, really I reckon, you, I reckon you can exploit that. I don't, I don't yeah. know, maybe Tristan, something this, this is something you could explain. It's because, like, I just always assumed, especially like the pod racing scene, for example, I've just always assumed that was CGI because so much of it just looks so digital. Like, do they do they build the miniatures and then just, like, paste over the top of it digitally or something like that? It just it didn't look the same as the miniatures that we used to see. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I honestly didn't know there was a lot of miniatures in there until a couple of years ago when I was reading up on it. And it's obviously yeah. it's not the entire pod race scene. It's mostly just yeah. the uh, grandstands and and like the area where the huts are and all that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's also they CG on top of that as well. It's like a base that they start with. Mm. Um, but yeah, there was there was a surprising amount in there, and it's it's been refreshing to see while the new ones not being great films still have an insane amount of CG. There is a return too practical work in it like Mm. the amount of aliens like background aliens and and Mm. all that kind of stuff going into it is it's nice to see there is there's a bit of resurgence happening with practical effects i think yeah i think it's because they went too far uh i don't know if they're that (laughs) self-aware or is it or is it is it like a like oh there's some hipsters in this generation who like vinyl uh maybe they'll they'll like old school effects like is it... no don't you want the electrical <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i like to think that it's more from the directors because you know when you're directing someone it's nice to have something that a actor can actually interact with and mm. see and not just mm. be staring at a green screen or a tennis ball with Dude. eyes on it you know yeah, like <laughs> And there's also it's the fact Joe. that practical, <laughs> practical looks nicer as well because you actually get in-camera light reflections and, mm. you know, things sit in the scene better than someone having to try and recreate that lighting setup in post-production. It's things just they look more believable. They age uh, way, it's also way the, better as well. Yeah, they do. And I, th- I think a big part of it is that films are just nowadays trying to show too much. Like mm. in the 80s and then, 90s somewhat um films couldn't show everything because it would look fake so they shot around what they could i mean jaws and alien are a great example of that like they tried Mm. shooting the alien and the shark in full and it looked terrible so they shoot around it and make it look a little you know it makes it way scarier you know your imagination fills in what you can't see 
Mm. But nowadays films are like, let's just show everything with digital and it kind of loses like something about it. Your mind switches off and you just, yeah, I don't know. It's a bit yeah. strange. Yeah, it's I, like you I feel think- like there's nothing more that I'm not, like I, there's nothing that I don't know about this. Nothing's going to surprise me. Like I've seen this creature, you know, I can tell from looking at it, like what it's maybe capable of. But like, yeah, when you watch Alien, you're like, until near the end, like you see its head sometimes. Yeah. You're like, what the fuck is that? Like, did, what, how did it like stab that dude? Like, I've, it, does it have hands? Yeah. Does it have tails? Does it have tentacles? Like, what the fuck is that thing? Or even uh, like Robocop, also- for example, as well. Like he, mm. they, they had to like shoot around him going up and down stairs because he couldn't walk up and down stairs in the suit. <laughs> Even though he fights like the, the big robot on the staircase, they had to shoot around him going up and down the stairs because apparently it looked like he'd shat his pants. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, I mean, it's interesting as well. I think there's, I think people give a lot more leeway to that sort of stuff. Cause I think like, if I think about my, my earliest memories of like practical effects that were, like obviously fake, but it did, I didn't really seem to care. It was like the old like uh, Lloyd Kaufman films, like tra- trauma film and stuff like that. <laughs> Toxic like Avenger. I, yeah, dude. Well, I uh, I bought a part of my show and tell showing on the screen at the moment. I have Lloyd Kaufman's book, Make Your yeah. Own Damn Movie. I got that book <laughs> as well. <laughs> it's it's such a good resource. And like, I mean, yeah. Th- this if there's someone out there listening and like wants to get into film, go and find this book, Make Your Own Damn Movie. It's fucking. It's so funny. Like Lloyd Kaufman obviously did. Yeah. Uh, like Toxic Avenger, Sergeant Kabuki Man, but then he also produced uh, and like distributed stuff like Cannibal the Musical and mm. even James Gunn's first film. Um, that's why he actually has like a, like a three second cameo in Guardians of the Galaxy because like James Gunn just likes to throw him cameos and shit. But um, yeah, I I wanted to read this part out because I thought it was really funny. Like in the special effects part when he's talking about crushed heads, he's just like. <laughs> it's like hollow out a cantaloupe fill with hamburger cranberry sauce and fake blood <laughs> top with a wig and crush until you can't crush no more for fuck's sake don't use watermelons watermelons are too thick to crush properly <laughs> while cantaloupes <laughs> will fall apart nicely and ooze gore in every direction i was like perfect absolutely perfect <laughs> but all that sort of stuff like it was so obviously fake like it's it's a really interesting read like he talks about uh in I think it's in class of Newcomb high. They needed to blow up the high school and obviously they couldn't blow up a building, but they found out about another building that was being demolished nearby. So like Tristan, as you were saying, like kind of shooting around things, they shot a really tight shot of this other building being blown up and then just quickly cut it into frame. So if you would actually like pause the film, it goes like school and then completely different building back to the school again. <laughs> <laughs> but because of how like how they like tightly shot it and whatnot, they just managed to get around it really, really easily. Mm. Well, so, oh sorry, no, you go. Oh, oh sorry, I was I was just gonna say, like, um, so I don't know much about special effects. Um, so I'm like that's why I was excited for this episode to do a big learn. Um, so I know that, uh, yeah, like we're definitely going to be running through like the history of practical effects and stuff, which I'm very keen for. Um, and yeah, like, yeah. If anyone wants to help kick that off, <laughs> it's like, a, that's me doing a really good leeway. That's just maybe I'm just excited. Segway. I just want to know. I'm segueing into like, I want to know the history and I want to know like where it is and where it's gone and, <laughs> Which we already talking about, but then I just orders in that right around the corner, didn't I? Um, hi. <laughs> well, actually, I don't like. Cause I, I did look up like what was the first like CGI effects, but I actually don't know what the first practical effects are. I guess maybe technically like a mask at a play in like the fucking BCs is probably the first practical I did, effect. I did. I did some nerdy research because that's how I roll. Um, <laughs> Uh, I know that stop motion was first used in 1898 in a yeah, right. Humpty Dumpty mm-hmm. circus. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a nice early one. Um, but um, one of the examples I like, I found a really good article that listed like some movies that really well summarize some of the key things in special effects. Um, and one of them is A Trip to the Moon from 1902, uh, directed by George Melios. Yeah, I was about to bring that up as what I thought would probably be the be- the first special effect makeup. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, um yeah. What is what is the makeup? I've never heard of this one. So what is the makeup in this? Well, I haven't seen it. It's, so it's, it's, it's all on <laughs> <interesting>. <laughs> 
It's, Handball. It's just like a, a man's face made to look vaguely like the moon. Oh, so right. it's the mighty like, boosh. It's the mighty boosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, actually, it actually is pretty fucking close to that, yeah. <laughs> actually, no. Wait, does it like... Because uh, now I'm picturing, now that you said that, I'm picturing an image. Do they, do they like land a rocket in his eye or something? Or am I making yeah, this up now? That's it. Oh, they they that. shoot, they sh- the scientists fire themselves to the moon via a huge space cannon, then fight <laughs> off some moon aliens and head back home. That's the plot summary I have. I've, yeah, I've seen that still of like, yeah, a person's face mm. as the moon and there's a rocket in it. But I've, I've never <laughs> ever. So what's it called again, Margie? A trip to the moon. So if if he's got the moon makeup right and someone's launching a rocket at his eye, is he technically also a stuntman? <laughs> I don't know. Yes, maybe, um, possibly. Um, and um, I so I haven't seen this, but apparently, like the costuming and the props, and like they use like smoke and effects, explosion effects, and stuff in it, which sounds pretty cool. I mean, it's a long way from, like, the first moving image films of, like, a train pulling into a station or something that people are like, <laughs> holy shit! And, like, so, like, apparently they had, like, some explosions and, like, smoke and stuff happening, which is really cool. <laughs> and, like, 1902 would have been pre-smoke machine, so dry ice and water. I don't know. Yeah, but dry darts were way cheaper water. back then, so. Yeah, <laughs> <true. laughs> Went hard at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what about Tris? Tris, what about for you? Who who do you think have been the most influential people, like in special effects makeup, like like throughout the history, as far back or as recent as possible? Who have really been the biggest influences in that scene? Well, the biggest is Dick Smith by far. <clears throat> um, Dick Smith, who's who's no longer alive, was uh, he like kind of invented a lot guy? of the techniques. Not the electrical company guy. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, he was an American makeup artist um, who invented a lot of the techniques and methods that we still use today. Um, he was he's, he's known as the godfather of makeup. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, so he, he's to this day the biggest biggest one you can get. I mean, close second, I would say, is Rick Baker, uh, who in his retirement is still making amazing stuff to this day and has done some of the best effects You'll ever see on anything. Fun. Personally, personally, then it'd be uh, Rob Bottin and uh, Tom Savini as well for me. Mm. Tom Savini, I love, I love Tom Savini. He's, <laughs> he's look, he's a little bit of a hack these days. Okay, y'all gotta <laughs> but, contextualize um, some of these people for me because I so, can't Google that far. Well, for me, like, uh, is it Bottin? I thought it was Botton. My bad. Uh, well, for me, like. Rob Bettine's probably my favorite. Like he did the thing. He did RoboCop, Total Recall, yeah, the thing, did man. Fight Club. Yeah, the thing. Probably my favorite practical effects ever. The thing. <laughs> but also, uh, I, yeah, I didn't know is. that. I agree. He did makeup in A New Hope and Airplane. I never knew that. Like <laughs> he was a makeup, makeup in assistant. Airplane. That is genuine sweat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just thought that was a. And also in the thing, Stan Winston had to come in at the end because Rob Bettine had pretty much worked himself into the grave making all these animatronics and stuff for the, <laughs> for the thing. So they had yeah, to get he was, legendary he was Stan Winston years to stand old. in. Yeah. What was his first like 23 years old major work, wasn't it? Because I think he was an assistant yeah, on movies. He worked for a that. year. Fuck. He worked for a what year a... without a break on the thing. Yeah, Put himself in a hospital. I mean, he never left his trailer. Yeah. He had like du- like pneumonia in both lungs. He just was just working mm. flat out. He's like, I'll 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 go to the hospital when the movie is finished. And he didn't make <laughs> oh it that God. long, unfortunately. But <laughs> fucking hell, yeah. he did some fantastic work. So who? Yeah. Who's well, Dick he was Smith? Rick Baker's protege. Yeah. Oh, so he was trained by Rick Baker, was he? So what was? I, I know the name. Like I'm just having a blank of what Rick Baker. What, what's his work? Well, he. I mean, his most famous would be American Werewolf in London, probably. Yeah. Because that was the first that got an Oscar for uh-huh. for technical achievement in makeup. Oh, yeah, that's the, that was the best well. wolf transformation scene ever. Yeah, um, um, in my in my research, I actually have come across <clears throat> like that it's still recognised as like one of the best wolf transformation scenes ever, which is awesome. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, because like you know, like I think everyone's seen a million werewolf transformation scenes now of like the mm. CGI mm. thing doing <laughs> something, and you're like, eh, but. Yeah, I think using practical effects, he got more of like the bone crunching. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. But he also yeah. made that look quite real. Like, yeah, because before that, they just like, you know, they'd, they'd flash a, you know, a flashlight. You kind of see like just a shadow just changing shape or something like that. But to be able just to Just flash see a picture in... of a human and a wolf yeah. really quickly between each other. Yeah. <laughs> ah, transition. Yeah, or they, either that. Or they do images and it'd be like a, a, an actor and then it would flash and then the actor would have some more hair on his face. That's, that's what <laughs> I was about like to say. Yeah. Up, as it white, flash, yeah. white flash. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, like pretty much that when he's turning into Hyde. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Just a flash just in between. Flashing as they go down. Down. Yeah. <laughs> but Margie, to answer your other question as well, because like Tom Savini, Tristan just mentioned as well. And he's, <laughs> I mean, he was, he was, he did like, you know, like the original like Dawn of the Dead. And then he did like a whole bunch of like horror movies throughout. But most people would actually recognize him if you've seen From Dusk Till Dawn. He plays the character mm-hmm. Sex Machine in From <laughs> Dusk Till Dawn. Oh, so damn. I, so that's how I always point him out. It's the dude with the, like the gorgeous like biker mustache. He's just always had that biker mustache. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I actually he's like, only... he's like 80 now and he still yeah. looks the same. He still mm. looks like Sex Machine. It's crazy. Now is what that special effects? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> he's, he's his own greatest work. <laughs> I, I actually well, I mean, only watched with... Oh no, you go, mate. There you go. No, I was gonna say I, was I only gonna say, with, with Savini. <laughs> <laughs> We're professionals, I swear. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, you go first. I was just going to talk about a movie, so yours yours would be more pertinent than mine. I was just going to say with Savini, funnily enough, Day of the Dead is the movie that made me want to do practical makeup, like prosthetic makeup. <laughs> That's funny because I, I was going to say I that. only watched Day of the Dead for the first time last week. That was <laughs> actually, That's what I was going to say. <laughs> well, the effects, man, the effects still stand up. And Captain yeah. Rhodes' death at the end with the fucking gutting and yes. choke on him, it's still so good. Good. Yeah. yeah, well, that's like my partner and I were watching it because, like, it's funny because there's, there's like seven zombies that look really good, and the rest of them are just like paint them fuckers green. I don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then, like, because my partner, she's like, oh, you know, you know, it doesn't look that good of Mike Madison's from like like 1980s. Like, it's it is what it is. And then it does the scene where they pull apart, and it's like, ah, there's the Savini. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that, yeah, that was the difference between like the foreground, and the background one. Cause yeah, I, I mean, Dawn of the Dead was one of his first films and yeah, he did the same sort of mm. thing. It's like the close up zombies they did stuff with, but like the background zombies were literally painted blue, but there's one scene where there's like a whole bunch <laughs> of zombies. I love. Like, it's the best, but there's one scene where like a whole bunch of blue zombies are walking across the screen and they just forgot to paint one of the dudes. And so there's just like a completely unpainted person <laughs> in this scene walking like a zombie. And every time I said, I just pissed myself laughing. But again, like you, you can't, you're just not allowed to get away with that in digital. I think people are so much more like, even if they're not like professional, like visual effects artists in any sort of way. Like, I think we, we give a lot more leeway to that than we would if it was done digitally. As long as we're done digitally, just like, nah, it looks like shit. Mm-hmm. Whereas like when it's done practically, like <laughs> it looks like shit. <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, I always just think about like that scene in the Mighty Boosh where they're like, we're safe. There's a ship powered. And it's like, oh no, that's, that's not a ship. It's just a tiny toy boat. And like, you know, they're using like the force <laughs> perspective <laughs> and then they just pick it up and it's like, Oh, I think about that all the time. Um, Fuck. You just reminded me of the Spice Girls movie just then. <laughs> oh. Quality. I don't like uh, I don't think I'm I've seen crim- that one. Criminally oh, underrated, out. but there is like yeah, it's it's basically <laughs> like the the theme of the thing is like these guys pitching a film to like the Spice Girls managers while the Spice Girls are kind of doing the things kind of elsewhere. But there's a scene where they have to like drive the Spice Girls bus across like the London Bridge while it's up, and they're like describing <laughs> the scene, and they're just like it's dramatic, it's amazing, and then the other guys like it's expensive, and then they just literally just get like a, like a matchbox car and drove it over a model of it. It's like ah, oh, maybe this is so expensive, and they just. <laughs> keep on going with the film <laughs> <laughs> <It's> fucking glorious <laughs> um, in, in preparation for this episode i watched um i watched avengers the last one what's the one where the uh end game that's the one yeah. um so i watched avengers end game because i was like what's the most expensive avengers movie and just went for the most expensive <laughs> avengers that movie because i was like yeah. that's where we're gonna find it all and fuck me the it it's it, it it's all CGI. It's like it's like they're like you know someone slams into the ground and like hits a piece of spaceship rubble or something. But the spaceship rubble is just a CGI thing, and it's like I don't know. It was just 
it was really painful to watch because it was just <laughs> mm. oh like they're notorious for like driving their digital artists into the ground as well there's a whole big thing going around yeah. at the moment oh. with disney artists like tristan i don't know if you know my, like more about like i just know like, the kind of cliff notes of it but do you know actually what's happening in that world at the moment well, basically, from what I know, is that there's kind of no, there's no oversight on the because uh, normally there's like ten or fifteen digital companies working on any one Marvel film, and mm. each of them do a different scene or a different part because they need you know it's too much to do. Um, yeah. And normally in post production, you'd have the director of photography or the director there overseeing everything, whereas all these digital companies are kind of on their own, just working stuff out. Mm. There's no real oversight on it, which is why there's a lot of differentiation in the quality of the VFX sometimes. Mm. But with what you're saying, yeah, essentially they're, because there's so much work to do, they're working crazy hours, low pay, you know, um, the lack of oversight is a difficult thing because you then, you don't have any real direction. So they're forced to do a million revisions where they have to finish the scene send it off to Marvel, they will say, no, change this. And then they'll have to go back and redo it all again. Like I was reading with, oh my God. I can't remember which film it was, maybe one of the Avengers ones, but where the last digital scene was literally finished the day of the premiere that night, <laughs> where they had to revise it the day of the premiere. Like, Amazing. Yeah. I, to a degree, though, I feel like that's, that's why a lot of these companies go with CGI as well, though, because... Say like you're doing something with practical effects, you can't just do a last minute reshoot. Like you got to get everything back together. Whereas they can the whole time still just like, oh, do it again in CGI. Who cares about the crunch? You know, run them into the ground. You know, this is worth billions of dollars. They're just people. Fuck them. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, like <laughs> capitalism. Just, just the yeah, slogan. <laughs> just like giving giving out the heart of a film just so you can get a quicker return on your universe that's just slowly and slowly getting more and more mundane. I don't understand it. <laughs> um, but I think so, that, that – Oh, sorry, go on, yeah, you go, just, you go. Oh, I was going to no, ask you. what you guys thought was the uh, turning point um, where, like, obviously it was around, like, the 90s when special effects, like, late 90s is when they really started coming in. Um, but, like, do you guys think that there was anything in particular that really pushed them towards using more and more, like, um, digital effects as opposed to using special effects? Like, like I say, effects. you have like the Matrix, for example, like, you know, doing all like, it's still practical in a way that they did all the camera work, but you know, all like the bullet time and stuff, you know. The people in the, the people in the green suits tilted yeah. in the back, that blew my mind. Yeah. I only saw that the other day. <laughs> well, I think how they actually shot it though, is they actually made a rig of all these cameras and like yeah. timed them yeah. to all take photos at separate times to make that 360 swivel shot, which I guess in mm. a way is a practical effect. But I think what first happened was everyone's like, oh, we've got this technology and it's super exciting. We can do all this stuff that was really hard to do with visual, eff uh, with practical effects. And yeah. then they all, everyone got lazy and they're like, oh, I can't be fucked with the practical effects anymore. Let's just do it all in CGI. And then they all watched it five years later and look, oh, that looks really shit now. I wish it did that practical. <laughs> well, it goes yeah. back a lot further than I, because I just always assumed like they only really started like in the mid nineties, but I was fucking watching uh, Ghostbusters the other day. And there is like, oh yeah. When, uh, when fucking Rick Moranis's character turns into Vince Clortho, like there is the, like the practical beast that they have at certain points, but when like they have him running across the road and it's the worst piece of like just computer, basically pixel art. I think I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> this piece, just, like running across the road. And I've like, I forgot that in the eighties, they like, they tried to make it happen. And then I think they realized they didn't have the technology to make it like even like semi believable. But I think it's because, like, there was so much other stuff going on, we kind of, like, let it go. But then, yeah, I like, for me, I, I think, like, Star Wars was the kind of that turning point. Like, I think that was what, was it 99, 2000? Was yeah. 2001, Phantom wasn't it, Phantom Menace? Uh, yeah. Phantom Menace, no, Phantom Menace was 99. Oh, it was yeah. I think it filmed around 97. Hmm. Yeah, so I think it was really, because yeah. it was when they started using, because that was... Was that, was that the first film that was shot as well. digitally? Yeah, I think it was the yeah. first feature yeah. film that yeah. was also shot digitally. And so I think it's yeah. as they kind of realized we kind of have all this. And you're just like throwing fucking more and more and more money at it as well, which I guess is the kind of 
the other part of it is like as the budgets have increased you know when they've just realized mm. they can just milk more out of this shit they're just kind of like ah here you go here's more money have some more money what do you need to do more money here's some more money yeah whatever. but it's also fine. ironically as well um i think yo the yoda puppet in Phantom Menace looks worse than the original trilogy Yoda puppet. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how does it's, that work? I thought it was CGI. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, he's, he's CGI in like two and three, but in like Defense of Menace, he's just like the worst puppet. <laughs> but That's what funny, I want to be described as the worst the funny puppet. Thing talking about, yeah, the worst puppet. <laughs> A funny thing talking about the budgets, like I learned today that uh, going back to RoboCop again, obviously looked up a lot of RoboCop today. Um, they kind of <laughs> shot the whole film, but they knew they weren't going to have enough money to finish it. So they purposely left out the scene where Alex Murphy gets killed. They're like, we're going to need more money and you're going to have to pay us <laughs> because we've left out an integral part of the film that we haven't shot yet. <laughs> That's big brain energy. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I mean- I've got... I, I came Sorry. across a theory on the internet that Waterworld was oh, partially to blame for going away from practical effects because of the disaster that was their giant practical set that they built. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, because it was like it was like a floating island, like a thousand tons or something, and uh, just everything went wrong. Um, <laughs> So apparently that's that's some theory that's a theory on the internet that uh it's an interesting you know? theory. It's an interesting what, theory. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because like Jurassic theory. Park at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. what did it open against? Um that was ninety five, so I don't know what it would have opened against because Jurassic Park was ninety three, so um that yeah, probably, what do you think, Tristan? Do you think I, building a giant floating island is impractical? <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> would you enjoy um, doing I that? I don't necessarily think it's I don't think it's necessarily impractical. I think the issue with that was the terrible script. Um, yeah, the whole movie was shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it would have been good. Uh, sorry, it wouldn't have been good even with a much lower budget or a higher budget. I think that movie was doomed to fail. It was if anything, I about it, 75 million. Yeah. I, it probably would have been better if I had a smaller budget because they would have had to have thought about it to make it good and it would have put yeah. some effort in. <laughs> so, yeah, like thinking about it definitely helps. Yeah. But sometimes but I, not thinking yeah. about it doesn't. <laughs> but I think what Grant's saying like kind of leads nicely into a, a, another question I had for you, Tristan, which is like, you know, I, obviously the budgets have increased dramatically over the years, but how does mm-hmm. how does the money affect the creative process for better or for worse when it comes to what you do? Well, for, so I think an important distinction to make is that what I, I, what I do is prosthetic makeup as opposed to special effects or practical effects, which refers more to like smoke and explosions and stuff like that. But for me, I've been very lucky and also spoiled that I've been working on big budget stuff for quite a while now. Um, the good thing about big budgets is is – you're not inhibited by worrying about how much material you have or, or you know, if you're going to have enough to make it last. You can actually just have the time to go, all right, I need to make this. I've got everything available to me to make it in the time I need to do it. And that's, that's a really big thing because, you know, I've done my fair share of indie stuff. I don't really like doing it anymore because of the constraints placed on you for that. Hmm. Um, yeah. With With the workshop side of stuff we do, issues happen that you can't prepare for. Like the materials we use are affected by heat. They're affected by water. They're affected by moisture. Like all these things can ruin what you already know how to do. And so having a bigger budget means that you've got that safety net of being able to redo it if you have mistakes. Um, so I definitely, I definitely think it's easy to work on a bigger budget. The compromise is that generally with a bigger budget means there's, more adults, more important people at the top that have to have their say. Yeah. So um, yeah. the creativity side of things can be quite limited, especially when you have to, like on, um, on I did the last Thor movie and it's like whenever you do something, it has to get sent to LA and have like 12 people sign off on it before you can actually <laughs> go ahead with making it. And so it kind of. What, what, did, you, you what did you do in the Thor like, movie? This is sick. Uh, so, well, interestingly with that, I, I also do props work. 
Mm. So, um, like, I made Thor's hammer, I made Mjolnir, I made um, uh, Stormbreaker. Pretty much all the weapons from the last Thor film is what I made. I just need to point out for anyone who's just listening to this podcast, you should watch this on YouTube because Margie's face, whenever Tristan just drops like another bit of like, oh, I worked on this, Margie's like head just explodes, uh, jaw hits the floor. It's um, it's wonderful to watch. It really is. See, I wish I was experienced. Like, I already know this because I've been seeing like posting for ages. So, like, I don't. I, I wish yeah. I was experiencing it for the first time too as well because it is amazing. Like, obviously, like it's like especially for such a large franchise for people to just like. You know, you, you just be so disembodied between things. It's like just even like how cool it is to like like Mjolnir, probably one of the most uh, you know iconic weapons from the Marvel universe. It's like, oh yeah, you know, I just oh, yeah. I just went in the shed. You know, I was like, hmm, spent a couple hours on Solid Works making a, uh, a, you make know, it a hammer, <laughs> and then I was just like, that looks cool in three D. Let's make it, <laughs> and we're all so like, it was. It was... <laughs> It was uh, 3D printed, then molded, and then we made them out of fiberglass and resin. Yeah, nice. Oh, that's really cool. Um, Because I study art conservation, so I know a lot about materials for things. It's like, it's just about (laughs) MacGyvering to be able to, you know, (laughs) fix shit. Um, That's pretty much what it is. But so I was like, oh, yeah, that's that's very cool. Um, Man, you should go to Comic Con. (laughs) (laughs) Just have your own store. Uh, not not that I should probably say this, but I maybe kept a hammer. Yeah. So well, plausible yeah, it's, deniability. It's a secret between us. Yeah. Secret between us four. <laughs> it's actually, we'll just, we'll just put like, like a black bubble across your mouth in the post. It's like redact- <laughs> redacted. Redacted. <laughs> I may have kept a redacted hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just pretend that you didn't say that and be like, you know, of, yeah. of the stuff that you were allowed to take away from the films, what is your favorite thing that you've taken away from a film? <laughs> <laughs> loud loud is an interesting term um <laughs> so i've got i've got quite a few things i've got um i did aquaman and i made the tridents and i've got one of those nice. that's pretty fun yeah hell yeah um i got some stuff from a good stuff from alien covenant um like a full set of alien eggs um oh, i I cast and painted the chest burster wound. And so I, that was like a, it was like a strap on one that they wore on a shirt. So I managed to keep that. But I think the coolest What's thing address, I got by the way, <laughs> yeah, just what, <laughs> what can we go visit? Uh, <laughs> I think if you ever need any conservation done. Covenant, yeah. mm-hmm. so, <laughs> interesting covenant. There's a scene in like David's workshop where he's got all these like Da Vinci esque. Yes. Pictures laid all around. It's a really, really cool set. So the concept artist for that film was a guy called Dane Hallett, lovely guy. Um, and he hand drew all of those on parchment in ink. And um, I have two of the originals of those frames. That is so fucking they are cool. just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Because I actually reckon that's the coolest set of the film. Like that room so cool. with Absolutely. all the drawings. Like all these, like, he's like, a, he's like these dystopian, like out of time medical drawings. It's done by this mm. like future Android. It's just like the, yeah, it's, oh, just the coolest setting in that film for sure. Is, I am. I Jesus, that's so fucking cool. What's the hardest prop you've ever had to make? Oh, the hardest prop. Um. Also on Aquaman, we had to do these. Uh, so like the Atlantean soldiers had these rifles and pistols that had to be completely clear but also hollow and filled with electronics but also waterproof um <laughs> and they were an absolute pain in the ass to make because <laughs> if you just, fuck it up you're electrocuting an actor no biggie it's fine yeah it's they, <laughs> they were really really challenging i'm just imagining they look like those like like mid 2000s like bc rich warlocks that will see through with like all the electronics yeah. in it. <laughs> <laughs> the controllers and stuff in the game it's like do they expect you to know like because i mean obviously involved in that you know there's there's casting and there's plastic work but then there's also electronics is technically a different field and then you say you do painting and do blood work as well do they just expect you to be a jack of all trades or did someone else do the electronics for it Oh no! There is there is a whole separate department just for the electronics. 
Yeah. Uh, very, very, very qualified people. But that <laughs> said, in a workshop, you are definitely expected to be a jack of all trades, or at least it works in your favor if you are. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Is there um, is there any kind of like shade thrown to you if you don't know those things and you're trying to learn on the job or are people accommodating to, you know, help upskill you even if it's, you know, just to help their, to reduce their own workload? Uh, everyone I've worked with has been very accommodating. Like I've learned so much working over the years and I'm always learning. Every day I learn something new and yeah. and I always want to be learning as well. I think if you ever think you're kind of there it's when you start to plateau and not do anything fun um and you can always learn stuff from the people around you and luckily everyone i work with in film is very welcome welcoming very accommodating and and more than happy to help you with anything you need yeah that's fantastic that's 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 heartwarming to hear like i I did think it like from what like like listening to i listen to a lot of podcasts about like pop culture movies effects and stuff like that and that's that's like what i have heard but also you never know when someone's just like if they've just said that in an interview or if it's like the actual truth. So it's nice to know that it is the truth that <laughs> yeah. people are actually just good. <laughs> sometimes. I have, I have a very yeah. important also, question. In- How quickly can you paint a black eye? <laughs> like if I, if I, if I really uh, need uh, to get out of work, like <laughs> how fast can we get that smacked on? <laughs> like two minutes. Perfect. <laughs> you can always you can always freelance as fake injuries to get you out of work. <laughs> I will say, relevant to uh, your question, Grant, um, in film there's workers known as above the line and below the line. Mm. So pretty much everyone in the workshops and, and on set is below the line. Everyone that handles money or anything important, it's above the line. Generally speaking, everyone above the line is a piece of shit. Yeah, sound like tracks. Yep. <laughs> so, so everyone, I mean, that's that's a very big generalization. There's some lovely people, but people below the line, as it's known, they're the ones that you know you're with every single day for months and months at a time. Yeah. You get close. It's like you have these little film families. It's it's a really great environment to be in usually. Well, that's like even like yeah, something I've seen you like posting about recently. Uh, like you just you've been posting about you just wrapped up uh, doing Furiosa, which is. I guess like a indirect, is it a prequel to like the Mad Max Fury Road? Yeah, it is. It's not wrapped up though. It keeps going. I don't think it will ever end. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, Mad Max Fury Road was like 90% practical effects, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, there was actually, there was a lot of digital in it that people didn't know, but it's mostly environments. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's when uh, you've done, that's how you know you've done like, a good job if people aren't noticing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't even notice it the first time, but like basically all the shots of like trucks driving through canyons, the canyons aren't there. The truck's driving on an open flat and they digitally put in all the tight rock walls and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, That's pretty cool. Did you... It's so oh, I, I, it works well. I just have to ask you a dub question because we're, we're not talking about Fury Road, but... <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask you if like, I was just talking about to talk to you as if you did Fury Road. And I don't know. Did you do Fury Road? Fury Road? <laughs> I didn't do Fury Road. No. Yeah, no. I was just going to ask if you met Andreas Kisser, but never mind. <laughs> <Just a bit>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A bit of weird trivia. The guy that's on that truck playing the guitar is a guitarist from Sepultura. But, um, what? All right. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. That's so right, funny. It's had like a brain fade between we're talking about Furiosa, not Mad Max Fury Road. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> i love that i love that well i think that's a that's a yeah i, I like to leave on a, a little like a tid point or a good note i think it's a good note to leave it on so i think we'll uh i think at that point we have to kind of move into the final question for the day tristan i'm gonna need i'm gonna need just to like get your email address because i have like a billion <laughs> stupid questions uh, <laughs> you now have no someone worries. who's gonna harass you <laughs> i love it i love answering questions <laughs> oh, excellent. I'm full of Well, we voice. have one more question for for you and the viewers. <laughs> yeah, we uh we absolutely do. We uh we we end with a final beat every single week, which is a ridiculous question that I always have fun just photoshopping in the world's worst photoshop possible. Uh the question <laughs> together and where where Trish, Trish we're going to start with you on this one. It's the question of who is more evil? Is it Emperor Palpatine or is it Lord Voldemort? It's Palpatine. There's no question. Why? Why? Because he wanted to dominate the entire universe, not just one planet. <laughs> he wanted to take over fucking I'm pretty, everything, I'm pretty and he did a pretty good job of it. On the UK, <laughs> did did yeah, he didn't even leave the country, Voldemort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. right? 
Whereas, whereas Palpatine fucking ruled galaxies. Yeah. No, Way I, I, I'm, I'm hundred percent with you. Like in my notes, I wrote down like, you know, Voldemort's sinking small potatoes here. Like yeah. Palpatine is macro evil. He's, he's, <laughs> he's industrially evil. Whereas, you know, Voldemort's yeah. just trying to accidentally kill a kid with glasses. You can't even do that. He's quite, he's quite petty, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. quite petty. He's, a grudge. If, he's just know, got a grudge. Yeah. If, you, if you look at it, you know, like the things that define being truly evil, in my opinion, are things that are like real heartless things like killing kids. You know, that's always like a thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, no. You know, Voldemort tried to kill a kid, and then I was like, "Oh, wait, the younglings." <laughs> <laughs> but I guess does outsourcing make you more evil or less evil? Because I guess he didn't do it himself. Oh. Yeah, so that's the question. Yeah, but he was his name was hey, at the top he, of the list. He though. killed Mace Windu. That's yeah. unforgivable. He was well, the only knows? black man in the galaxy at that didn't time. Didn't die on screen. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> so all right, so Mar- Margie, is your answer Palpatine as well then? Absolutely. It's got to be. All right. He's racist. I'm going gonna, gonna to disagree with all three of you and say Lord Voldemort is more evil, and I'm going to put it down to this. I feel like on the same level, they'd probably done – I actually hadn't thought about the fact that Palpa, that Lord Voldemort doesn't leave the UK. That's a very interesting <laughs> point. But if you look at how they treated – uh not the people that they don't like but the people that they like they work with like emperor palpatine was actually quite gentle with anakin skywalker for the most part and and until his admirals be- until his admirals <laughs> betrayed him he was pretty good to his admirals as well whereas lord voldemort is a dick to everybody he's a dick to his followers he's a dick to fucking everybody that he works with so it's not even like he doesn't have like that sort of like oh we're working together so i'm going to be nice to you like he's literally a fuck to everyone <laughs> I feel like an important distinction there, though, is that Palpatine was manipulating Anakin into yes, doing what I was he say wanted. That. He was not actually being nice to him. He was yeah. just making him complicit in becoming evil. Yeah, but and also then, and he doesn't then even all pretend. Of the, all of <laughs> all of the people who follow Vol- all the people who follow Palpatine, like all the people working in his empire at higher levels, even when like they might not be down with the empire or whatever <laughs> they're not gonna fucking misbehave because the man can shoot lightning out of his fingertips he doesn't need a wand he can't be killed by a baby he's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but, but also like, is it, it yeah. i don't think it's a fact of voldemort being evil i think he just has a bad attitude and i think that's the reason why he can't even get out of the uk <laughs> with his regime I think, he's just, <laughs> I think he's just really racist he's like a, yeah yeah all, all like, well, yeah, just wizard lives matter or something, and like, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, 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 I'm also, sticking with it. <laughs> look at even no, like, no. look at kill count, look at kill count. Palpatine, whether indirectly or directly through his his commands, his kill count would be in the billions. He wiped out planets. Yeah. He killed yeah. anyone and everyone. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm just I'm just focusing on their personality and I, I, I think I'm <laughs> sticking with Voldemort. I'm sticking with Voldemort as more evil because he he didn't even feign niceties. Well, Every originally, single person he's originally when I posed when I was thinking of this kind of comparison, I was like Palpatine or Hitler? And then I was like, no, we can't do that. <laughs> that's, you can't do fiction in real life. No. Um but I'd just like to say that in my opinion, they all fall in the same ballpark. Fair. Very, very, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say that's that's basically the same thing. I mean, like the George Lucas pretty much did, you know, make the the empire was the fascist regime. You know, whether and it Palpatine was, the was a vegetarian, the and Palpatine was a vegetarian. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But we're gonna put it out to you, dear listener. It's uh, it's three versus one in the uh, in this nerd chat, and we need to know who do you think is more evil. You got to follow at Northside Nerds on Instagram. Uh, on the Friday afternoon, we post the the hilarious Photoshop job that'll be done by me. Uh, and there's links to uh, our uh, Discord server now. We have a Discord server that Grant's set up that we're kind of having some fun with. Uh, Twitch streaming's happening at the moment. We've got some fucking cool things happening. And Tristan, thank you so much for being our first guest. On, thank you so uh, much. Yeah, Bow- 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 Bass Bass have been sick. Oh, Bow- Did you say Bow- Bow- Absolutely, it was good Bow- fun. Bow- 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 <laughs> No, thank you so much. That's I have I have learned so much, and now I want to change career paths. So oh, who knows? Maybe in the maybe in the future when we're creatively bankrupt and we can't think of out of the box topics, and we just start f- 
straight out cover and movies. We'll get you back to talk about them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, like and subscribe. Tell your friends. Tell, tell your, your mum. Tell your kids. Don't tell your grandma because she probably won't like the swearing. <laughs> I don't swear. What? I do. What? I all My the name's time Margaret. I'm I'm a grandma <laughs> grandma Margaret. friend. Uh, Margaret. Margaret. <laughs> <laughs>